Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter but not the spirit of request. Thank you friends for subscribing, likes, and supporting in the comments. And today's first story is, trying to trick me into taking your shift? Sure you can drink my smoothie. This happened to me about a week or so ago but I'm still not over it. Need to share this with somebody. I'm sorry for any spelling mistakes, English is not my first language. This story takes place in Sweden by the way, so first some important backstory. I'm a part-time student at a local college. My schedule is what you'd call like really chill. I have full school days on Monday and Fridays, but on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I only have lessons in the afternoon or at night. Wednesdays change for week to week, but this means that I have the opportunity to work at a daycare two to three days a week. I love my job. Both the kids and the adults are great. Well, most of them, but I'll get there. I mostly work with the older kids, but I also work in the kitchen when the regular personnel is sick or has the day off. The day of the incident, I was working in said kitchen. The layout of the kitchen is really dumb. I believe the building used to be an apartment complex before it was turned into a daycare. The rest of the place looks really great, but the kitchen is a mess. It consists of two narrow corridors creating an L shape. The big industry dishwash is in one end of the room, and the sink is in the other end of the room, with the oven and stove in the middle. As you can imagine, this creates all kinds of problems. The worst one, however, is that in front of the sink there is still the remains of a wooden door frame that never got torn down. This means that the little trolley that we put food and dishes on doesn't fit through the doorway and we have to carry the dishes by hand if we want to rinse them in water or pour something out in the sink. This will be important later. Over to the story. So I was preparing for lunch when one of my coworkers was walking in. Let's call her Katie. I only know Katie by reputation since she often works with the youngest kids, but I did know that she was a part-time substitute like me and had a close friend on the daycare's board. Katie was also notorious for being late, but she always got away with it because of her friend. Katie smiles at me and asks if I could take her shift tomorrow. So this happened on a Thursday, which meant that even if I wanted to, I couldn't work the next day. That Friday, my class was also supposed to go on a day trip to one of the big cities. She knew this since it was all I had been talking about for weeks. I was so excited. I explained the situation for her and very politely said no. Her face dropped and the smile turned into a big frown. Katie started telling me this story about how she needed this day off to visit her dying nephew in the hospital. She told me that he didn't have much time left, and if she didn't go tomorrow, she'd never get another chance. Fun fact about me, I'm a big pushover who doesn't know how to say no to people. I think this comes from being a shy goody two-shoes who hates disappointing people. If you just put the lightest purchase on me, I crumble like a house of cards. When she told this, I felt like a horrible person because I couldn't help her, but I managed to stutter something like, sorry but I can't, and suggest for her to ask someone else on the work team. But nobody wants to, she said. Not everybody else is busy, or they're all working tomorrow. This then raised a small red flag within me, so I stood my ground and told her something along the lines of, I'm really, really sorry, but I can't. But if it's a family emergency, I'm sure the boss can give you the day off. I hope that your nephew gets better. I tried to smile at her, but she just looked at me with this cold, almost scary expression on her face. Then she leaned in close to my face and said, You're being really effing selfish. If my nephew dies, it'll be on your conscience. With that said, she left, and I felt like the world's biggest jerk. I felt like a jerk for doubting her story and for not shifting with her. I'm ashamed of myself for only thinking of my day trip. Later when I come in with the lunch trolley for the youngest kids, Katie is just mean mugging me the whole time and started making horrid comments about me like I wasn't even in the room. She did this in front of the kids and teachers. This becomes too much for me and I had to excuse myself and go to the bathroom just to hold back tears. My body is shaking and I had to keep telling myself to breathe because my throat was closing up. I couldn't stand the thought of my coworkers thinking I was a horrible person who didn't let someone see their dying nephew. I just wanted to melt into the floor and disappear. After maybe 5 or 10 minutes, I've calmed down and my breathing was back to normal. I heard a knock on the door. On the other side is one of my work friends. Let's call her Jane. Jane looks at me and she can tell that I'm upset. She pulls me into a big hug. This calms me down even more and when she asked me what happened, I was able to tell her the story. She listens with great patience and when I'm done, she lets out a sigh. Fun fact about Jane, apparently she's known Katie all her life. They're the same age and have always gone to the same school. She tells me that the real reason why Katie wants to get off work is because she's going to a concert with some friends. Jane told me she's been posting about it a million times on Facebook. This is why no one else wanted to change shifts with her. And then she dropped the bombshell. Katie doesn't even have a nephew. She's an only child. I got peeved. I don't think I've been this mad my entire life. How dare she call me selfish? I mean, what kind of psycho makes up a dying kid to get the day off from work? I start fuming just thinking about it. But it also kind of lit a fire under my A. I was done letting people walk all over me. I had to start standing up for myself. Jane promised me to talk with both Kate and our boss about this. We hugged and I went back to work. Later I'm in the kitchen cleaning up after snack time. 
Thursdays are smoothie day, which both the kids and teachers love, so I usually make extra and save a jug with smoothie for the teachers in the refrigerator. Today's no exception. All the jugs in the daycare looks the same, iron ones with a lid attached so the kids won't spill as much. So because of the kitchen's dumb layout, I usually take one of the empty jugs and pour the leftover liquid in there first, and then dump in the sink. This is so I don't have to walk over to the sink with every individual glass. I pour water, coffee, tea, milk, and smoothie with wet napkins piece and crumble up bread into the jug, shut the lid and put it on the table. The bell to the dishwasher rings, and I walked over to take out the dishes. The door opens and Katie storms in. She doesn't say anything, just gives me the stank eyes and walks over to the jug on the table. She grips one of the clean mugs and starts pouring. I raise my hand and try to tell her to stop. She turns to me, eyes blazing with hate. Jeez, just let me have this, would you? Okay, I'll let you have this. So I just watch as she takes a big gulp of my disgusting smoothie. Her face goes from smug to panic in a second. She rushes over to the sink to spit it out. Then she turned to me with this what the heck did you do look on her face. I remain calm and say, like I was trying to tell you, that's not smoothie. Then I give her my sweetest smile and say, I hope you have fun at the concert, Katie. Her face turns bright red and she runs out of the kitchen. The next day I got a phone call from my boss, asking me why Katie is saying that I tried to poison her. Apparently Katie had called in sick the next day, claiming that my smoothie had made her sick. I explained the whole situation for him and he promised to look into it. Then I called Jane asking her for a favor. I tell her to screenshot everything Katie posted for the concert on her social media and send it to our boss. He might need some help with this investigation. Next time I came into work, I heard from Jane that Katie doesn't work here anymore. I can't lie, it felt great. The second story is... Pay rent by the first or vacate the property. My roommate had suddenly lost his job just before the turn of the month, and we knew there was no way we'd make rent. He already had another job lined up, but it would be a couple of weeks before he was paid. It was about five days prior to the first when we went to go see the property manager. We informed her of the situation and told her we'd pay what we could and even had no problem paying late fees or whatever else was coming our way. We signed a lease and we understood that there would be penalties for missing rent. She didn't want to hear a word we said. She only said that as per our lease, we were required to pay rent on the first of each month. So we went back to our apartment discouraged and uncertain as to what was going to happen and what we were going to do. I started looking up the local laws on renting and eviction and learned that an eviction takes 30 days in my state, so at least we wouldn't be homeless. We racked our brains for the next few days trying to come up with some way to pay rent, but despite searching through local, state, and federal law, trying to sell a bunch of our stuff, and even trying to borrow some money, we had nothing. It was the last day of the month. I was walking up to our door and saw a piece of paper hanging on it. I assumed it was an eviction notice and was surprised that it was a day early. Luckily for me, it was our ticket out of the apartment. A handwritten note from the property management company rustled slightly, in the breeze. It simply read, pay rent by the first or vacate the property. Signed, B office lady who didn't want to listen to you. Okay, I admit it, that's not really her name. Having familiarized myself with local renters' rights over the last few days, I knew that this note counted as a signed document, stating we had permission to break the lease and leave the property. We knew we weren't going to pay rent, so we did exactly what she told us to do. We vacated the SH out of that place. In less than six hours, we packed up all of our SH, threw it in our cars, and found another apartment that gave us 30 days to give them a deposit, because we had good credit. She called us the next day, and the next ranting about property abandonment and how we owed her rent. But I knew that we only filled two of the three required criteria for property abandonment, and I explained to her what her note meant from a legal perspective. To this day, I have no idea how someone whose job it is to make money off of people in apartments could let this happen. Why the heck did she even leave that note when the very next day she could have posted an eviction notice? Part of me wants to think that she did it on purpose to help us out, but she was too B for that to be true. And the last story is, difficult customer demands we place her very heavy sofa onto her delicate wooden floorboards. You got it. Back in my warehouse days, there were occasions where the customer service manager, who's still a great friend of mine even to this day, would ask for myself and a few warehouse workers to help him re-deliver and reinstall a repaired and reordered sofa for a customer. The day of the re-delivery, the customer service manager, CSM, pulls me aside and warns me that this lady is extremely difficult and aggressive. In this instance, she ordered a leather sofa and a high-quality leather, paid top dollar, waited for 22 weeks, and on delivery decided she didn't like the color. Now, normally the company doesn't do reorders for change of mind when it comes to choosing the wrong color, but this lady made such a fuss and complained so much that the general manager made an exception. We get to the home and our contract driver is just unloading. The customer has chosen a massive three-seater recliner with a metal frame and bracket on the bottom. Normally with the metal bracket comes special plastic stoppers that go on each foot of the frame and each edge of the metal bracket so that no damage will occur to a customer's floor. As we carefully navigate the sofa into this lady's lounge room, she starts being loudly that us warehouse workers are dirty, idiots, lazy, too slow. We begin to unwrap the lounge and this lady is getting impatient. She's being to the CSM. 
How much longer is this going to take? CSM reassures her that we're taking our time to ensure that the sofa is unwrapped and in perfect condition. What we also notice is this lady has light wooden floorboards, so I immediately move to start placing the stoppers on the floor. This woman starts shrieking. Why is he touching my lounge? Is he breaking it? Me. No, miss. I'm just... Woman. Don't talk to me. Get your filthy hands away from my lounge. Me. I just need a few seconds to put these rubber... Woman. Put my lounge down now or I'm calling the manager. I shoot a look to the CSM and he just shrugs. We place the sofa directly onto the floorboards and we can already hear a scrape. CSM hands the lady his paperwork. She signs off on a successful redelivery and signs off that we have assembled the lounge as required and placed it where she wants. This lady smirks at us and plonks herself down onto the lounge. There's a scraping sound as the metal frame digs into the wooden floorboards. We grab all the plastic packaging and make our way back to the store. Guess what was waiting for us? A customer complaint. According to this lady, we damaged her very expensive floorboards. CSM shows where this customer signed off on a successful redelivery and that we assembled and placed the lounge to her satisfaction. She got exactly what she asked for. Thank you for watching the video to the end. Have a good one.